Um, before I introduce the next panel, I want to insert into the record a statement provided by Alexander Main, the Senior Associate for International Policy at the Center for Economics and Policy Research. Uh, and I'd now like to welcome our second panel of witnesses. They are Robert Mahoney, Deputy Director, Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, Karen uh, uh, Deutsch uh, Kalikar, uh, Project Director of Freedom of the Press at Freedom House, uh, Reverend Isma Ismail Moreno Coto, Director of Radio Progreso in Honduras, uh, Vladimir Kata Mirza, Washington Bureau Chief, Russian Television International, uh, RTVI. Uh, so um, I welcome you all here, and we begin with Mr. Mahoney. And again, I, I apologize for having kept you here so long, but look forward to your testimony. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. You got to press your microphone on. That's oh, yours. That's yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting uh, me to uh, testify uh, on behalf of the Committee to Protect Journalists. You will have heard of uh, Marie Colvin, perhaps the famous American war correspondent killed in Syria this year, and you've probably heard of photographers Tim Hetherington and Chris Hondras, who were killed in Libya a year earlier. But I wonder if you've heard of Fahan Jamil Abdullah, a radio reporter in Somalia, or Byron Baldeon, a freelancer in Ecuador. These are just two of the names on the committee's list of 31 journalists who have been killed this year so far in the line of duty. They're typical of most of the journalist deaths that CPJ documents. They were local journalists working in their own country, and they were deliberately murdered, targeted because they got too close to the truth for someone's liking. Their killers may never be found. That's the distressing pattern in most of the media slayings. Impunity is the norm. Of the 647 journalists murdered in the past two decades, 579 have been killed with impunity. That's almost nine out of 10 journalists whose families and colleagues will never receive justice. The reality is that combat and crossfire casualties have long been a relatively small subset of all the journalists killed, about one in six cases. And these murders do not take place in a vacuum. They occur in societies experiencing war and conflict, although many of them, like Russia, Colombia, and the Philippines, have democratic forms of government. Countries where impunity is the norm range from big ones like Russia to tiny ones like Honduras. In Russia, 16 of the 20 cases of journalists' murders since Vladimir Putin first came to power 12 years ago remain unsolved. Honduras, which is suffering from the fallout from a coup three years ago, coupled with drug violence, has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And at least 14 journalists have been killed since President Lobo took office in January 2010. Such levels of impunity globally send a terrible signal that media lives are cheap and they force journalists into self-censorship. It really is a dangerous time to be a journalist. Over the past five years, we've seen an unprecedented expansion in the range of attacks and challenges faced by journalists and bloggers around the world. Violence has not only claimed lives, it has forced hundreds of journalists into exile, particularly in East Africa. Meanwhile, sophisticated online censorship coupled with punitive laws that suppress the reporting and dissemination of news are robbing peoples around the world of the information that they need to be true citizens. If reporters are spared death or exile, they are likely to end up behind bars. Last year, the number of journalists in jail reached a 15-year high, nearly 200 worldwide. Their continued imprisonment sends, sends the same silencing message as the murder of journalists. Despite the release of 70 journalists with the assistance of CPJ uh, last year, our research shows that the number of journalists in jail remains persistently high. Most are held on state security charges. In fact, the abusive use of national security was the single greatest charge invoked to justify journalist imprisonments last year, followed by violation of censorship rules. The vast majority of those journalists are local journalists, and they're held by their own governments. 65 journalists, or over a third of those included in our census, are being held without any publicly disclosed charge. Iran and China have long had the dubious distinction of heading our top jailers list, but recently they've been joined by a country that may surprise many in the West, Turkey. After several years of legal and constitutional reform prompted by Turkey's application to join the European Union, the moves to lighten the dead hand of the law on journalists are beginning to fade. 
The United States seems wary of calling out Turkey on its human rights and press freedom record. Turkey is a NATO member and a crucial U.S. ally. It's a progressive, secular democracy and a model of free speech compared with its neighbors Iran, Iraq, or Syria. But for journalists, particularly Kurdish and leftist journalists, progress in freedom of expression has not kept pace with political and economic advances. Turkish journalists and press groups estimate that there were 5,000 criminal cases open against reporters at the end of 2011. The cases involved charges such as criminal defamation, influencing the outcome of a trial, and particularly spreading terrorist propaganda. The bulk of these cases have not resulted in convictions, but the endless court proceedings and legal costs have had a severe chilling effect, according to the reporters that we know. Prosecutions have intensified since 2007, when the details of a, a conspiracy called Agenicon, a conspiracy by the ultra-nationalist ultra militaries to overthrow the government first emerged. The Turkish government disputes the level of uh, imprisonment, but nevertheless, we believe that uh, the, our exhaustive research on individual cases and legislation show that there are many dozens of journalists in jail in Turkey who are there in direct relation to their work. And we will be issuing a report on this uh, this fall. Some of the most prominent journalists and writers have been targeted. Take, for example, the case of Ahmed Sheikh, whom I interviewed in Istanbul just a, a few weeks ago. He was released from more than a year in pre-trial detention in March. And he's been charged with aiding the coup plotters. But his real crime was writing a book on the political influence of the Muslim community headed by Fatullah Gulen, a religious scholar who lives here in the United States. Criticizing the government, Schick said, and drawing attention to the dangerous network of people in the police and judiciary who are members of the Gulen community is enough in today's Turkey to get you uh, indicted as an Ergenekon suspect. Mr. Chairman, if pro-Western democracies like Turkey can lock up journalists for critical reporting, then what are we, press freedom defenders, to say to the more repressive states? If increasingly powerful and wealthy countries like Brazil, Russia, and India do little or nothing to bring journalist killers to justice, what message is sent to the rest of the developing world? We who enjoy the benefits of a free press have a duty to protect and defend those journalists who every day face death or imprisonment just for doing their job. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Um, Kalika? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify before the Commission today. Um, I'll try and be very brief and to jump through some of my testimony since you already have the written testimony in front of you. Um, I'll talk uh, mainly drawing from findings for our, from our Freedom of the Press Index, which we've been producing for over 30 years. Um, and as many people know, for the past eight years or so, we've shown declines in the level of an, um, media freedom worldwide on an annual level. And this phenomenon has affected practically every region of the world. Um, in contrast, the latest edition, which we released in May and covered um, the calendar year of 2011, although it was positive in showing a potential reversal of this trend, and we did see gains in a number of countries um, in the Middle East in particular, these gains um, remain very precarious. We've already seen um, setbacks to democratic prospects and media freedom occurring towards the end of 2011 and into 2012, as some of the revolutions have faltered in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya. Um, and continued civil strife has led to increasingly severe restrictions on freedom of expression in other countries in the Middle East, such as Bahrain and Syria. At the same time, press freedom is continuing to face um, considerable obstacles and reversals in many parts of the world. China, which boasts the world's most sophisticated system of media repression, stepped up its drive to control both old and new sources of news and information through both censorship and arrests. And we have other influential authoritarian powers, such as Russia, Iran, and Venezuela, who continue to resort to a variety of techniques to maintain a tight grip on the media, including detaining some press critics, closing down media outlets and bra blogs, bringing libel and defamation suits against journalists. Um, these states are also notable, um, I think, for their attempts to restrict media freedom and influence the news, news agenda beyond their borders, not just within their borders. Another disturbing trend identified by Freedom House in recent years is the decline in media freedom in a number of um, democracies, some of them somewhat established at this point. As a result of status downgrades in a number of previously free countries in the past few years, including Hungary, South Africa, and South Korea, 
the proportion of the global population that we consider that enjoys a fully free press has fallen to its lowest level in over a decade. And currently, only 14.5% of the world's people, or roughly one in six, live in countries where coverage of political news is robust, the safety of journalists is guaranteed, state intrusion in media affairs is minimal, and the press is not subject to onerous legal or economic pressures. Um, I'll try and point to a few sort of ongoing threats um, and issues of concern. Rob has already talked um, a little bit more about the, the murders and the use of legal cases and laws against journalists, so I won't delve into that too much, but I'll highlight in addition to these two very important issues, um, the use of licensing and regulatory frameworks to um, ensure control over particularly the broadcast media um, by a number of authoritarian countries. So this includes um, shutting down of radio or television stations or denying licenses to stations altogether. Um, we also see increasing um, attempts to control sort of uh, new means of news dissemination. So this includes internet-based media, social media, and, and also transnational media. Efforts to block transnational news have become particularly common um, during and following the Arab Spring uprisings, um, where the power of these media to affect political change became even more apparent. Um, so we saw authoritarian governments um, employing techniques ranging from information blackouts in the state media um, that happened in Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, as well as sophisticated internet and text messaging filtering as in China. Um, finally, I'll point to a, a region of particular concern, um, Latin America. We've seen um, declines in Latin America in each of the past five years, and this has shown the greatest decline of any region um, according to our index. While some countries such as Mexico and Honduras um, have been plagued by violence by criminal groups and non-state actors, um, in other countries journalists have been targeted by governments that are openly hostile to media criticism, such as Argentina, Bolivia, and Venezuela. In particular, I'd like to highlight highlight significant backsliding in Ecuador over the past few years. Um, two countries of particular concern, which I know, um, one of which we wanted to highlight at this hearing, are Russia and China. Um, and the media environment in Russia um, remains um, particularly you know, closed and is characterized by sort of control over the broadcast media, the use of the judiciary to prosecute independent journalists, um, and as Rob has mentioned, com almost complete impunity for physical harassment and cases of murder of journalists. Um, we did see that there were some positive, I think, um, breaks in Russia due to the op relatively open social media and the use of these media, particularly last year in the elections. Um, but these media are not where most Russians get their news and information. And so the, most people are still getting information from pro-government media. Um, in recent weeks, we've seen these um, several bills that are likely to become law that would further threaten the media environment in Russia, including um, potentially, potentially having more controls over the internet, as well as the recriminalization of libel, which was decriminalized last year. So there's already been backsliding on something which was a sort of positive step in Russia. Um, in China, we've also seen um, very, a range of continuing controls, um, particularly after the Arab Spring uprisings. Um, and I'd also add in terms of China, that, in, as well as what's going on within China in terms of jailings, things like that, um, China's influence in the media environment can also be felt far away from its borders um, as the government extends its reach over the global media environment uh, through the place of, for example, Chinese-produced news on channels in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, so I hope these remarks have given just a flavor of some of the threats um, faced by independent media. Um, please, you know, contact us for more information, and we'd like to submit our entire recent uh, report for the objection. congressional record. We'd love to have it. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Vladimir Karamurza. I should point out uh, that Mr. Karamurza, I'm sure as you'll explain in your testimony, two weeks ago the Russian government revoked your media credentials. Uh, which I think is a blatant act of media repression. So uh, uh, we very much uh, regret that the Russian government took that action, but we are very glad to have you here and look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That, that's certainly very mild compared to all the other situations we've been discussing, but I thank you for holding this important and timely hearing and uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my views on the media freedom situation in my country. Um, Lech Valencia once observed that the attitudes of uh, authoritarian regimes towards the independent media fit into the formula, break the thermometer and you will not have fever. Uh, for Vladimir Putin, breaking the thermometer was an early priority. Uh, one of his very first actions in office, in fact, uh, has been the destruction of NTV, at that time Russia's largest independent television channel. 
uh, which provided uncensored news and analysis to millions of Russian viewers. Um, it was known for its hard-hitting political, live political talk shows, satirical programs, and NTV had fiercely criticized the Kremlin over its wars in Chechnya and over government corruption. And uh, President Boris Yeltsin used to say that when he didn't like something on NTV, he switched off his television set. President Putin had a different approach. He, he switched off NTV itself. Um, and um, as a last chapter of this uh, prolonged confrontation in the early hours of the 14th of April 2001, uh, security guards from Gazprom, the state energy uh, giant, uh, physically took over NTV's offices in, in Moscow's Astankino Television Center, taking the channel under its control. And later attempts by, by journalists from NTV to continue their work elsewhere were thwarted with uh, similar um, efficacy. Uh, in 2002, the Russian authorities switched off the transmission of TV6. Uh, and uh, finally, in 2003, TVS, which was Russia's last nationwide independent television uh, station, was cut off the air by the order of then press minister, uh, Mikhail Lesin. And the official reason offered for that was, I quote, the interests of viewers, end of quote. So for the past um, nine years, Russia's national television has been uh, a discussion-free zone, as has already been uh, mentioned by my colleagues here. Uh, with the rarest of exceptions, no opposition leaders are allowed on the air. No alternative viewpoints are offered. No criticism of the regime uh, is permitted. Uh, th there was a study in 2007 during the parliamentary election campaign in 2007 conducted by a Moscow-based NGO, the Center for Journalism in Extreme Situations. And that study... Uh, was uh, devoted to the news coverage on Channel One, which is Russia's principal uh, state-run television station. And the study found that 87% of the news coverage was devoted to President Putin, his administration, his government agencies, and his United Russia Party, 87%. The two democratic opposition parties at that time, the Union of Right Forces and Yabloka, received 1.6% of their time between them. For years, Russian television has had to deal with the so-called stop lists, the informal list of politicians who cannot be shown on the air. In fact, just last year, Vladimir Posner, who is the leading talk show host on Channel One, publicly admitted that, quote, there are people whom I cannot invite on my program because these people cannot appear on federal television, end of quote. And among them, he named, uh, for example, opposition leaders Boris Nemtsov and Mikhail Kasyanov. And I think it's, it's important to stress that even the privately owned media uh, outlets in Russia are by no means immune to, to government pressure and to political pressure. Among the recent examples are the, um, for instance, the raids in February on the offices of Alexander Lebedev, who is the publisher of Novaya Gazeta, the newspaper of the late Anna Politkovska, who was mentioned many times at this hearing today, and the freezing of the bank accounts from which the newspaper was, was financed. Or also in February, the, the prosecutorial investigation into Dorst, a small satellite internet TV channel which had extensively covered the anti-Putin protests in, in Moscow. Um, just two weeks ago, um, Dmitry Solopov, who was the editor-in-chief of Commerçant FM, uh, a talk radio station in Moscow, resigned from his post, citing, among other reasons, his unwillingness to, quote, compromise, end quote, with his conscience. And he confirmed that the station's owner was, in fact, unhappy with the independent editorial line. Um, and as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, I, I've had myself the opportunity to, uh, uh, to witness the extent of the Russian government's uh, control over the media just in the past couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, I was stopped at the gates of the Russian embassy here in Washington and told um, that I'm no longer allowed inside uh, because uh, Ambassador Sergei Kislyak had ordered to annul uh, my media credentials. And the official explanation was that I am, quote, no longer a journalist, end of quote. But the puzzling detail was that the order from the ambassador came before it was publicly announced that I'm being dismissed from RTVI, which is also a privately owned uh, television network, effective September the 1st. Former Russian Deputy Prime Minister Boris Nemtsov has learned from his sources in Moscow that the directive to place me on a media blacklist came from Alexei Gromov, who is President Putin's first Deputy Chief of Staff uh, in charge of relations with the, with the media, press and television. And the blacklist apparently extends not just to RTVI but to other Russian media outlets, thus making me, in effect, unemployable. This is what, what the Germans call a Berufsverbot, a ban on profession. The same sources indicated that the reason for the blacklisting was, was that I, along with many other representatives, as you know, of Russian civil society, political opposition, and independent media, um, have been a vocal supporter of the uh, Sergei Magnitsky Act, uh, which proposes to sanction corrupt Russian officials and human rights violators. I, I feel really bad because I'm the author of that bill. Well, no, no, and I, was, I, I feel like I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I was just coming to that. I was yeah. just coming to that that uh, you know, bl blackmail should not be allowed to succeed, including 
certainly in this case. And I think, in fact, the criminal reaction, which has been widespread, I mean, mine is just one case. There's been a lot of similar things happening. But I think it shows that this legislation hurts them, you know, precisely, hits them precisely where it hurts. Uh, and, you know, this, this is the, the missing and the much needed measure of accountability for those who continue to violate the rights and freedoms of, of Russian citizens. And I think it's a very pro-Russian bill, and so do many of my Thank colleagues. And, and I actually want to take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership on this issue. You've been the lead sponsor of this in the House, uh, both in last and in this Congress. And, and I do hope that before the end of this year, it's, it's passed and signed into I law. believe it will be. Um, if that's possible, the, the environment for civil society in Russia is getting worse. As, as has been indicated in the last few weeks, the State Duma has rubber-stamped a series of repressive measures uh, directed against the already besieged civil society, um, which include the 150-fold increase in fines for, quote, violations of public rallies. Uh, the recriminalization of defamation has, has been mentioned, or the new law that forces Russian NGOs, which receive funding from abroad, to, to tag themselves as, quote, foreign agents. Um, and this law has been signed by President Putin the last few days. Yet in spite of all of this, uh, of everything that, that I've talked about, I remain very much optimistic about my country's future. Because while television, national television may still be censored, it no longer matters as much. In April of this year, for the first time ever, a private internet search engine, Yandex.ru, registered a larger audience than any of the national television channels. And according to TNS Russia Research Group, the gap between the, the total daily television audience and the number of daily internet users has narrowed to just 900,000 people. It's 31.4 million for TV and 30.5 million for the internet, respectively. And it will not be long until the internet replaces television as the main sources, source of information for, for Russian citizens. And in fact, um, as you know, last December after the flawed and rigged parliamentary elections, thanks to the internet and the social media, the, the news of the mass fraud, mass election fraud quickly spread around the country uh, leading to Russia's largest pro-democracy demonstrations in two decades, as tens of thousands of people came out in the streets of Moscow and other cities to uh, <coughs> demand political reforms and to protest against uh, authoritarianism. I'm optimistic because young, middle-class, educated Russians are no longer willing to tolerate Mr. Putin's authoritarianism. Uh, they're tired of being politically voiceless. They're tired of the lies in the official media. They don't want to be told who's going to rule over them for the next six or 12 years. Uh, in short, I think they want to be citizens in their own country. And this, in my view, is the best guarantee that, despite the efforts of Mr. Putin, uh, Russia will one day return on a path of, a, of an open, modern, and democratic society. I thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, very much for your testimony. Um, finally, we have uh, Father Ismail Moreno Coto, who's the director of Radio Progreso in Honduras. And I, I, want, uh, I want to thank Father Moreno uh, for being here. I want to thank him for making the trip. Uh, from Honduras to testify at this hearing. Um, and um, I appreciate uh, all that he has done uh, and um, in promoting this, the issue of uh, freedom of the press, but uh, also the, his real courage in defending freedom of the press in Honduras. So um, uh, we are grateful uh, for you, for your being here, and uh, we welcome your testimony. Muchas gracias por esta oportunidad y también por tolerar que comparta con ustedes en mi idioma, en mi, en mi propio idioma. Thank you very much for having us here and thank you also for uh, tolerating the fact that I will be sharing with you in my own language. En efecto, vengo de, de Radio Progreso que eh, tiene 24 empleados de los cuales 15 gozamos de medidas cautelares por la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. I work at a radio station called uh, Radio Progreso, and of the 24 employees at the station, 15 of us are now are under protectionary measures of the Inter-American uh, Human Rights Commission. Esto es una expresión de, la, de una preocupación de sectores de la, de la comunidad internacional por la situación de violación a los derechos humanos de Honduras, pero que no se corresponde con la atención al interior de las instituciones del Estado. This is, an expression, this is an expression by the international community of their concern for the human rights situation in Honduras, um, but it doesn't seem to correspond to their, uh, to, there doesn't seem to be a corresponding concern for the state of the institutions in the country of Honduras. Lo digo de una manera clara. El derecho a la libertad de expresión en Honduras está aplastado porque la institucionalidad del Estado de Derecho está 
derrumbada o enajenada de su ser y función. And so I want to be very clear, the right to freedom of expression in Honduras has been crushed because the institutional structures of the rule of law have been crushed or have been alienated from their true functions and put at the service of those who have power. Si en tres años han sido asesinados 25 comunicadores sociales, significa que la democracia hondureña tiene fallos de fondo y que necesita soluciones de fondo. The fact that in three years, 25 social communicators have been killed in Honduras means that Honduran democracy has deep problems and it needs in-depth solutions. La muerte o asesinato de estos comunicadores sociales no tiene un patrón ideológico o político común que lo origina. There is no political or ideological pattern that emerges in terms of the origins of these murders. El patrón común que lo origina es la ausencia de funcionamiento de las instituciones del Estado. Es decir, el patrón común se llama impunidad. The pattern is simply that in all of these cases, these murders have happened because of, of the lack of, uh, of, because of the institutions of the state are not functioning. So in a word, impunity. La gravedad de, de este patrón de impunidad reside en que quienes lo sostienen o avalan son personas y grupos que dicen representar y defender la democracia. Y algunos lo hacen a través de medios que dicen de ver, defender la libertad de expresión y la veracidad de las noticias. The seriousness of the reality of this pattern of impunity resides in the fact that those who are sustaining this impunity and backing up this impunity are people and groups who say that they represent or that defend democracy, and many of them do so through the media that says that they are defending freedom of expression and truthfulness in news reporting. Son personas y grupos honorables, integran la fuerza viva de la sociedad, representan los liderazgos políticos y empresariales, han concentrado enormes recursos, riqueza y poder mediático y político y gozan del reconocimiento y respaldo de diversas instancias del gobierno de los Estados Unidos. The people that maintain the system are people that are considered honorable. They're very active in society. They represent political leadership, business leaders. They, but they have concentrated enormous resources, wealth, and power, both in the media and political power. And they enjoy recognition and backing of the various uh, entities of the government of the United States and of the international community. La libertad de expresión está condicionada por esta ausencia de funcionalidad de, del, del Estado de Derecho y esto también obliga a la autocensura. The, um, the institutionality of Honduras is lacking and that is what is conditioning the possibility of having freedom of expression in the country and this is leading to censorship. En Honduras necesitamos apoyar la construcción o, recu o recuperación de la institucionalidad del Estado de Derecho y de la democracia. Para ello, sugiero aportar en las siguientes medidas. So in Honduras we need to support the construction and recovery of the institutional structures of the rule of law and of democracy and to do that I have the following recommendations. Número uno, es necesario impulsar y apoyar mecanismos de protección de los comunicadores sociales, defensores de derechos humanos y líderes y organizaciones sociales que en los hechos se esfuerzan por abrir paso a su derecho a ejercer la libertad de expresión. First of all, and as a prior condition, we need to put in place and support mechanisms that will protect social communicators, human rights defenders, leaders of social organizations, people who are trying to pave the way to make sure that this freedom of expression can be exercised. Número dos, es necesario exigir y respaldar los esfuerzos de depuración del Ministerio de Seguridad, el Ministerio Público y la Corte Suprema de Justicia. Second, we must demand and support efforts to purge the minister, Ministry of Security, the Public Ministry, and the Supreme Court. Número tres, es conveniente condicionar toda ayuda internacional a estos esfuerzos de depuración acompañados de la demanda porque se enjuice a todas las personas, tanto de las Fuerzas Armadas y de otros sectores del Estado, que se han vinculado a violaciones a los derechos humanos. We should also condition all international aid on efforts to do this purging of, this, of the institutions and accompany that with a demand to try everyone in these institutions, including the armed forces and other sectors of Honduran state that are tied to human rights violations. 
no puede existir una nueva institucionalidad si no se restablece el Estado de Derecho y sin hacer frente a la impunidad. We cannot have new institutions, nor can we reestablish the rule of law without first confronting impunity. Número cuatro, es muy conveniente exigir al actual gobierno hondureño la implementación de las recomendaciones sugeridas por la Comisión de la Verdad y la Reconciliación, especialmente las concernientes al respeto a la libertad de expresión, el libre acceso a la información pública y la democratización del acceso a los medios de comunicación. Fourth, we must uh, demand that the current Honduran government implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, especially those concerning the respect for freedom of expression, free access to public information, and the democratization of the access to media. Número cinco, es muy conveniente respaldar el Sistema Interamericano de Derechos Humanos de la OEA como instancia a recurrir cuando un Estado como es el de Honduras ha perdido capacidad o se muestra negligente en el cumplimiento de la ley, o cuando encubre o protege a violadores de derechos humanos. Fifth, um, it is important to support the inter-American human rights system of the OAS because it is an entity that we can go to when a state, as in the case of Honduras, has lost its capacity or shows itself to be negligent in compliance with the law, or when it covers up or protects violators of human rights. Número seis. Es conveniente exigir al Estado el cumplimiento de aquellos compromisos y convenios internacionales suscritos relacionados con los derechos humanos y la libertad de expresión. We must demand that the state comply with all those commitments made as signatures to international agreements um, on human rights and freedom of expression. Y número siete, es conveniente respaldar y proteger los diversos esfuerzos por construir redes de radios y de medios de comunicación comunitarios que han surgido tras la constatación después del golpe de estado del control de la información y de los medios por reducidos oligopolios. And number seven, finally we must uh, support and protect the various efforts to build networks of community uh, radio stations and other community media outlets, especially since it has become evident now that small media oligopolies have control over the flow of information. Y finalmente también demandar la derogación de la ley de escuchas telefónicas que en lugar de abrir a la libertad de expresión la endurece y nos sitúa a todos los demás comunicadores en una situación de mayor precariedad. Muchas gracias. And finally, there is an additional one. We need to make sure that we overturn the law of telephone uh, conversation interception. Um, there's a law that makes it harder for us to operate as communicators and makes the situation easier.